Hello, happy Tuesday. Welcome to our second episode of Human Centered Leading. I am delighted to be with all of you today. Um, before we do some of the, the, the um, uh, slide review uh, that we would kick off our, um, which has important information, it's not just slides. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining our community. Um, Hummingbird Humanity is a community of people who want to make the world better and want to make workplaces better. Um, and we, you know, we believe that when we create human-centered workplace cultures where humans thrive, humans win, the organization wins, um, and that's you know, good for humanity and good for business. So um, thank you for being part of that conversation and being part of the change that's in the work. Uh, in the works uh, to, to create workplaces that are inclusive and welcoming for everyone. Um, and again, since this is a community, we encourage you all to connect with each other. So if you're watching today on LinkedIn or if you're watching on Facebook, make sure you share your information in the chat, comment in the chat, or even ask questions in the chat um, to, um, to connect with each other. And um, for those questions, we'll do our best to answer all of your questions during the course of our conversation today. Um, so let's bring up the, the slide so I can just share a few highlights as we get started and, and introduce our guests. So again, this is our second episode of Human Centered Leading, um, where we bring together thought leaders and experts to talk about current workplace challenges um, and um, topics that are really important to leaders today and certainly to employees um, across, um, across organizations um, today. So um, today we have a great conversation around social impact and how important that is um, for our workplaces to embrace not only philanthropy and volunteering, but also really just how they think holistically about making a difference in their communities. But before we get started and introduce our, our guests, I want to highlight and just a, a reminder that there are holidays and, and heritage days and weeks and months that, are, that happen throughout the year that are important to employees in our workplaces. Um, here are the, those events that are coming up over the next uh, few weeks. So I encourage you um, to think about if you have employees um, that you know who might be celebrating or honoring these days um, so you can, to, can just help them feel seen um, um, as uh, and the days that are important to them. And I'm also thrilled to announce um, that um, in the spirit of today's conversation, we are launching the Hummingbird Humanity Foundation. The Hummingbird Humanity Foundation provides educational materials, resources, and books to children, caregivers, and educators in order to create more human-centered cultures at home, in schools, and at work. Through our investments in authors and illustrators that identify as members of marginalized communities, along with a focus on themes of increasing representation in the areas of race and ethnicity, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, career pathways, disability and cultural religious awareness in age appropriate ways, we intend to create space and dialogue where all members of our communities feel safe, respected and heard. I'm thrilled to, to share that we are launching the Hummingbird Humanity Foundation today um, and, um, and we'll be sharing more in the coming days and weeks about how uh, we hope this foundation will make a difference in the lives of young humans everywhere. And now let's go to our introductions of our expert guests. I was trying to remember which slide was next. So first, I'm delighted to welcome one of my dear friends, Hillary Meyer, who is the Senior Vice President of Impact at Athletes Unlimited. Hillary and I played volleyball together what seems like a lifetime ago when we were much younger and it was easier to recover after those games. So Hillary, so happy to have you here. And I am delighted to welcome Michelle Soraco, who is the Chief Impact Officer at Televerde and the CEO of the Televerde Foundation. Michelle and I met just, um, I think, three months ago um, at the People for Forward Network Impact Awards, where Michelle and Televerde were honored for their amazing work, um, which we're gonna learn about today, so I'm not gonna to get, to get to, to, to try to do the, take Michelle's talking points about what Televerde does. So um, let's start with, you know, talking about who we are, and I'll, I'll you know, just for those of you who might be new to, new to the um, Human Bird Humanity community, I'm Brian McCormick, the CEO and founder of Hummingbird Humanity. I use he, him pronouns, um, and um, I have a career and background in HR um, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I am also a gay man, um, and I'm disabled. And uh, 
I'm also a white cisgender guy, um, so I try to use my empathy with others who've been who felt like outsiders. With those experiences of mine that um, that um, certainly have had those moments where I felt like I've been othered um, with my privilege as a white cisgender man to open doors for others and to challenge the status quo, so the world is more inclusive for all of us. So, Michelle, would you like to tell us a little bit about you? Oh. Sure, I'd love to. I didn't know I was going first, but thank you. I just wanted to mix things up. I told you I like to go off script. So. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, uh, Brian. It's a, it's an honor to be here, and thank you uh, for inviting me to join you um, at this great conversation um, about humanity in the workplace. I am, you know, it's always the the toughest question is, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. The, it's the the where do you start and where do you the, where do you end, and so. Um, I'm Michelle Sirocco. I am currently, as you said, like I've got a couple fancy titles, Chief Impact Officer for uh, Televerdi and CEO for the Televerdi Foundation, um, which are both organizations that I am incredibly passionate about because um, they're, Televerdi is a business that was founded um, almost 30 years ago based on the idea that providing incarcerated women with jobs and training um, employment while they were uh, in prison and then real career opportunities after their release that they could build a profitable business um, while providing the women with the marketable skills necessary to transition back into the in, into the community successfully. And so um, for me, when I heard about Televerdi, um, it was exactly what I needed. So, uh, you know, I, I always say, you know, when you ask a little girl what she wants to do when she grows up, the one thing she never says is I want to go to prison. Um, but that's exactly what I did. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And so because what happened is when I got there, um, when I got there, I heard about this thing called Televerdi and, and rumor had it is if you could get a job there and you were really good at it, you could get a job at their corporate office when you got out. And so um, I looked at the situation and I said, this is my golden ticket. I've got two little kids that, that, that I've lost custody to. I've lost my self-respect. I've lost everything. I've never had a, a job other than, than Tend and Bar. And I sure love Tend and Bar, but I didn't want to grow up and be a 40-year-old bartender. Um, and so this company, you know, found me where I was and provided me with the opportunity to, to rebuild my life. And um, that is what's led me to where I am today, um, where I am the Televerdi Foundation and the company of Televerdi. My job is to, to promote awareness for the business of Televerdi, but also um, to provide real opportunities for incarcerated women um, to learn the skills, knowledge, skills, tools, um, that they need to successfully uh, transition back out of prison and, and be and join the global workforce. And so um, that's actually where I am today. So I apologize for my my blurry background, but I'm actually sitting in uh, the women's prison in the state of Arizona, where um, we're going to be interviewing some women to join our one of our programs this afternoon. So it's great, phenomenal, rewarding work. Absolutely. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us and thank you for the, the work you do and sharing your story. I, I know um, from my own experience of sharing my story about you know, when, we, when we are visible, it makes a difference in others who, who don't know that they can share their stories and, and can find success on the other side of something that might feel like life ending. And as you've said, it, for you, it's been an inspiration in your journey. Um, and so thank you for sharing that. And we'll talk more about that. Um, Hillary. Would you share with a little bit about you and, and your world? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I was really honored to be asked by Hummingbird Humanity and my good friend Brian to be part of the conversation. I feel really passionately about it. So I'm Hillary Meyer, she, her pronouns. I am a white cisgender queer woman. I live in Los Angeles. Um, I'm a mother and um, of two little kiddos. And um, I am here on behalf of uh, a job with a company that I really love, um, Athletes Unlimited. We are a network of professional women's sports leagues, and um, we are a public benefit corporation, which means that we have uh, we have bigger missions beyond just shareholder profit. So um, the work that we do around social impact, environmental sustainability, all fits in my work stream, um, and that's. Uh, 
that's why I'm here to talk about my work, but I'm also happy to talk about myself and my journey as well. So excited for the conversation. Well, and before we go further, tell us about you, uh, the person, because I know there's a few things you should share. Um, me as a person, well, I, uh, I think of myself as an athlete <laughs> and we bought, Brian and I played volleyball together. Uh, and I, you know, it's hard. I laugh at saying that because now I'm amongst professional athletes. And so I'm sort of chump change compared to the athletes that are in our league. Uh, but I, um, I grew up on the East coast and, um, I come from, um, a number of privileged positions in my life. And, and that, um, has been really important to me as, as I've, um, my career has been almost entirely in nonprofit work, um, specifically in the LGBTQ community. And, um, and that's, that is both a, it's a privilege and a position of power that I sit in to be representing these, um, conversations and in these spaces that, uh, especially as a white person, when we're talking about race, for example, um, and socioeconomic prison and some of the things that Michelle is going to talk about, like I, that I take very seriously the position that I sit in and I want to be really, um, I, I want to be, uh, just acknowledge that that's, that's where I am. And I hope that I can use that position to, to better my workplace and better, um, the work that we're doing across the country. And did you mention that you're a mom? I, don't know if you, yeah. I did mention that. I have two okay, I missed, kiddos. I was yeah. processing a question uh, in the prep call. Hillary forgot to mention that she was a mom. And I'm like, I know you're a mom. You have two little ones. Yeah. And, you know, the, and for those of you who might be new to Hummingbird, if you've been with Hummingbird before, you know that we, we talk about both who we are and what we do. And workplaces tend to only focus on the latter. We only talk about what we do. Um, and you know, we believe, um, and I believe, that it's so important to talk about who we are. Uh, we spend a significant amount of our life and our time in our workplaces. Um, and if we know each other as humans um, first and then do the work together second, we can do better work together um, and see each other. So, um, so thank you, Michelle and Hillary, for being here and sharing your stories. Um, and um, I can't wait for this conversation. So, so to start, one thing that I, we'd like to start with is to talk about how we just define the topic. So, you know, when I <clears throat> there's a couple things that I typically say around social impact. So, I mentioned philanthropy and volunteerism. So, the, the corporate giving and the it's you know giving employees time to to go out and volunteer and do things. And the other thing that I say often is. Um, because I, I've done a lot of work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, that DEI is very much a, something that happens sort of in, inside the company, and social impact is an external expression of that commitment. Um, and uh, so those are the two things I say. And I, I'm curious, so I'll start with you, Hillary. How do you define social impact, whether it's similar or different from what I've said? Uh, certainly all of those components um, uh, are part of, of what I think of as social impact, Brian. And, and I think of it as um, how, as a, as a corporation, are we showing up to advance good things in the world, ultimately? And so that can be internal, that can be external. And in fact, my work um, is, is, a, is a mixture of both. Um, but it's how do we, how do we, how do we responsibly um, bring better betterment to the to the communities that we work and to the to our employees who work with us. That's how I think of social impact. Awesome. What about you, Michelle? I, I think it's very similar. I, I always just describe it as you know how businesses get involved in in solving the societal problems of today, right? And and then what is the outcome of their involvement? I love that. I love that. You just reminded me of. And I'm not going to try to, to say the specifics because I'm going to, I will forget some of the specifics, but we can find it and share it in the chat. Uh, Kate Spade, when I had a chance, when I worked at Tapestry, just coach Kate Spade, Stuart Weitzman. Kate Spade um, built a factory in, um, it's a, an African country uh, where the, 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 in this particular location has a significant poverty level. Um, and uh, they, created jobs for the women in this community. And they've expanded to allow men um, to be part of that, that workforce as well. And they've significantly increased um, the, the, the opportunities for those individuals. And they, they not only are they 
job opportunities, but their life skills that they get taught, um, and they create products for Kate Spade. So sometimes we think about you know giving money and giving time, but sometimes it's also creating opportunity, as you said, Michelle, solving societal problems. And so that's a good segue into like your why. So you know, Michelle, I want to go you know to you. You you were you know you are, not only are you. Um, working to serve this community, you are part of this community of formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, I'm curious about how that has shaped your why, of why you you left um, prison and decided to stay doing that work. Well, I I don't really think it, it happened quite that, it wasn't that linear of an effect for me. Well, we're going to just pretend it was. No. <laughs> um, I'd like to say that I was that good of a human to begin with, but no, it, it, it's been a it's been a journey for me. So, um, you know, when I, when I got to prison, I, you know, the first thing that happened was, I, first of all, I got significantly more time than I ever expected to get. I, and and so when I got to prison, I, I first met with my counselor and, and he said to me, he said, you know, he said, you can spend your time worrying about how to fit in here, worrying about what other people think about you, or you can use this time to become a better version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And it was honestly, it was the single best piece of advice anybody had given me. I, I, I grew up an, an, an awkward kid in, in uh, Western New York, and then we moved to the big city and I became an even more awkward kid um, doing whatever I could to try to fit in, you know, overly obsessed with what other people thought about me, which is what ultimately led to, you know, m- this misguided entrepreneurial spirit and this, uh, you know, really good at making really bad decisions that got me to prison and, you know, just trying to follow along with the crowd. And so to have somebody say, you know what, Hey, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about that. That was for me, that's where everything changed in my life. And and I started to work on myself, on, on who I was and what I needed to be to become the best version of myself. And, and so as I, as I transitioned through prison and, and out of prison, it was never about, um, the greater good. It was all, it was only about what was going to be best for Michelle and Michelle's family. I, like I said, I had two small children. Um, it was about getting a really good job, getting a really good career so that I could provide a better life for my children. But it was on that journey of doing that, that I realized that my experience was something special and unique, that that wasn't wasn't the same experience everybody who had went to prison had. And, and so at first it was just as simple as, you know, I came out and I was in sales and I ran the sales department for for years. Um, And it was just as simple as the more I could help this company grow, the more women who could have a similar experience as me. And, and so that's still all it was, but that was just, that was my, why I was helping this company grow. Um, And so fast forward, I, I stayed on that path and, and, and I, you know, made the, the ultimate journey from going from cell block to C-suite. Um, and, you know, I was working as chief marketing officer uh, as about four years ago, and I was asked to um, take on this chief impact, chief social responsibility officer. And honestly, something happened there because 20 years I've been working in this job and I really wasn't paying attention to what had happened in our country as it related to prison and incarceration and what was going on. Because during that period of time, we had managed to become number one in the world in incarceration. Uh, Like we have 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And, and that was a journey that, that took place over the 20 years while I was working in the space. I just wasn't aware of it. And, and I found out horrible things like uh, four out of five women in prison are mothers and 66% of their kids are under the age of 18. And that's 70% of those children are doomed to follow in their parents' footsteps. And so that was when I realized that we, we had the secret sauce I mean, it sounds crazy to say that now, but I knew instinctively that I had watched thousands of women have the same experience as me. And I I thought, well, how can we replicate that? And um, we contracted Arizona State University actually to to prove that we had the secret sauce. And they did. They came back and they said our women were were um, getting out of prison and and they had 94 percent employment, earning salaries four times the national average for a formerly incarcerated woman. And their recidivism rate was less than 6%. So 
for those that don't know, recidivism, hard word to say, is the rate at which people go back to prison. And in our country, it ranges from about 48 to 82 percent, with 82 percent of all people going back within within eight years. Um, and so I thought that's what I really that's when my why hit was like I knew I knew that we had something special that we could really make a difference. Um, and how could we replicate what Televerdi was doing um, to reach more women than just the ones that had the opportunity to work for us while they were incarcerated? It's a long answer to your short question. Hey, you know, I am nothing but the person who gives long answers. So you're in good company here. So I love that. And, and, it's, and I, I love it and I really appreciate it. And I, I appreciate your the honesty and also just the the opportunity to learn and like that, that's another big part of what um we try to champion in our work at hummingbird is let's know the rest of the story um and so all of us have much more to the story than what we first see or the first headline um you know whether that was formally incarcerated well we all have biases and the, that is going to someone who's been in prison or jail we're going to have a bias about what that person is and what they can or can't bring and there's more to that story. Um, and so you're part of, you know, you being here is part of changing that story for some, for people out there watching. So thank you for doing that. We're going to come back and talk about tribes in a second, because that, I think there's, you know, there's a, something else that what you were talking about is how, you know, trying to find a way to fit in, which is something that I think so many of us as humans um, can really connect with. Um, and, you know, that shared humanity of experience of it doesn't matter whether you're a formerly incarcerated person or a tall white guy or a gay woman. Um, and, you know, in Hillary's case, like we're all just trying to fit in. Right. That's just a human experience. So, Hillary, tell us a little bit about your why. Well, my why is a bit um, shorter than Michelle's. Thank you for sharing so much of that of your story, Michelle. It's so beautiful. Um, my why is there are so many people in the U.S. and, of course, internationally, but I'm pretty domestically focused, that uh, are so marginalized um, from conversations, from employment, from um, – spaces that we just take for granted um, that I can't really imagine doing anything other than trying to figure out how to contribute to solving some of those issues. And it's sort of, there are moments that are just really, that feel so devastating and so insurmountable, um, you know, particularly with race relations in our country of the past few years, like looking back we're just seeing history repeat itself over and over and, and it's and it's a it's demoralizing but that's what gets me up in the morning right is how do we how do we get up how do we fight for the underdog how do we how do we in our in our business in our um in our personal lives how do we try to make the world a better place and and really that's that's my why um and i did that, like I said, I did that through nonprofit work for many, many years um, and moved into this public benefit corporation um, that's doing it a little bit differently from a different um, side of the, the equation. And it's, it's important um, and, it, and it's critical for me um, to sort of maintain sanity uh, in a world that is just continuously kicking people while they're down. And I'm, I'm curious, Hillary, I have, I have two questions you can answer both or or which one of her sort of strikes you strikes you. I'm, I'm curious if there was anyone. Well, the first one is as a, as a woman and even as a gay woman, have you felt that marginalization in your journey? Um, and, you know, was there someone or a moment where someone like made opened a door for you that you thought might have been closed? Well, specifically as it relates to sexual orientation, certainly, um, you know, it as as I realized that I was gay, staying in the closet was a safer place for me, as I think it is for a lot of um, a, a lot of folks who are um, in the LGBTQ community, uh, and so. I guess I would say I did feel marginalized, but it was sort of like a self-constructed marginalization. I, I once I realized um, if I could just 
be honest with people, be honest with myself, be honest with my community, with my surrounding folks that I knew I'd be supported. And it felt a little scary, but it, it ultimately that that was on me. Um, and so so coming out was an important part of my journey. Um, folks who have really mattered. I mean, I I love to to look at representation and that that I can't emphasize that enough on how that shows up. And, and it could be LGBTQ folks. It could be formerly incarcerated folks. It could be people of color. It could be people of different, um, you know, religious backgrounds, like having leaders in our community and whatever that looks like and whatever forms that take has been really critical. And so specifically around sexual orientation, like having, having people that are in my life that were out and, um, you know, and, and living living their lives as an openly LGBTQ person, that that's really important um, to see, especially as a as a young person trying to figure out the world. And um, and so that's that's just a, it's a simple message, but it's something that that I think really matters um, it, uh, as we're sitting here and you know as as business leaders and just in in, in community, um, trying to be as as open and authentic in your community, I think is is really critical because it does matter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know the you you, you highlighted something that I think is really interesting for um, those of us with aspects of our lived experience that are invisible, um, that are we get to choose to share them, and there and there's two sides of that. There is the, as you mentioned, the the self-imposed. Um, can I share this story? And some of that self-imposition comes from the stories we've heard from others and what we have or haven't seen in the world around us. Um, but there's also a privilege in that sometimes of like, I can be in a space that I can choose not to share if I don't feel it's safe, right? Um, and that's something that, that makes us different. It's interesting, Hillary, when you were, you, you used the word representation and, and I couldn't help but think that um, what's really a shame is that, you know, here in our prisons, uh, the LGBTQ community and people of color are significantly overrepresented in our prison systems, right? And it's it's because I, I always kind of look at it as is the world has a way of using our prisons to to deal with problems they don't understand. That's fascinating. Well, and you know, and Michelle, just before we um, we started the call, Jade, who's behind the scenes and one of the people that helps bring this show to life. Um, was uh, was with us and was we all learned something new and she was I know she was so surprised about um, you know the, that you know with when you were talking about when um, you're in prison you you build these relationships but that changes on the other side can uh, you're going to tell it better than I can so I'm going to let you share with the, the, the community that's watching yeah I, well I think what we were talking about is you know the work that we do is is we have this comprehensive reentry program that we do for all the women. Um, starting about a year before they get released. And in that program, we, we talk a lot about community, right? Because as I mentioned earlier about my personal story, is I got really good at kind of following the crowd and doing what the crowd was doing. Um, and so we really look to, to create a new sense of community. We call it a tribe. Um, and that, you know, you it starts in here. You become part of our tribe of, of women who are on a similar path with a similar desire to have a better life. And then when you transition out of prison, this is a fact that everybody's always shocked when I say that. You know, you could be in prison for, for one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever the number is. And while you're here, you live, eat, work, sleep with the same people and you have your you know you have your besties your bffs who are the ones that every day you sit around and talk about your hopes and dreams and plans and visions for the future because that's what everybody here is doing is dreaming about the future and then the day comes that the the day that you've been waiting for you walk out the door to celebrate your release but now you no longer can communicate with any of those people that were part of your tribe previously um, you, you're, you're not only, you could actually go back to prison for communicating with them. And so you're thrust out into this world. That's really a new world where you somewhat feel like an alien, um, because, you know, you haven't been here for how many ever years it's been and you don't understand. It's like visiting a new country when you get out of prison. 
Um, and so it's really important to us to create this new sense of community. And so the women then come out and we have the tribe of the hundreds of people who have been released before them and, and you know, building that sense of community so you can walk the path um, and have the support of somebody who's actually already done this successfully before you. So, um, and that's what we were talking about, you know, with Hillary before is this, this sense of how marginalized people in some ways are more likely to form their own communities so that you, you know, so that you can find a place to fit in because we're all really just trying to fit in, aren't we? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and what you're, what you're describing, um, it reminds me of the, you know, the stories that I, I, I hear in 12 step spaces a lot. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> I am I, unfortunate is the right word, but you know, having um, you know escaped the world of addiction, and but it, it never took me out where that was my entire world. Um, but I, I, have, I have people that I that are, I'm friends with, but that was their world. And when they say I'm going to go live a sober life, they have to leave their entire life behind and start a new life. And so those twelve step spaces, we become their community, and we become friends with each other. And um, you know, the I was uh, talking, my sponsor and I were texting last night, and. Um, he made a, a joke, but it's true of how, um, you know, we are, we're, we have, it doesn't matter our backgrounds, we all have a shared experience. And so he said, it's how a formerly homeless um, drug addict can become the sponsor for a CEO my, and, and help me on my journey. Um, okay. and, uh, and it's really a beautiful relationship we have. And um, I think, you know, those, those moments that sort of give us the opportunity to connect that are outside of our privilege or our experience, like it's, a, this is something that really connects us. And but you need that community, that tribe. And that's how Hillary, you and I know each other. We played volleyball together in a queer, predominantly queer. Um, I think there, we, had a, we had a couple of people that weren't part of the LGBT community that played with us because everyone is welcome. Um, and, uh, but that was, you know, that was such a beautiful community. Um, you know, and, and I think that's been a big part of your journey when you talked about your career journey, you've also, grew up um, in, in your professional life in LGBTQ plus organizations. So what, what was that, having that tribe around you on your journey like? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's so interesting. I was just thinking when you, when Michelle, you were just talking about the sort of the importance of creating that community. Like I was thinking about workplaces and how it's so important actually to allow I'll get to your question in a sec, Brian. But <laughs> to, to, allow, to allow employees to, to gather and have spaces that they can share community and whatever that looks like. Um, and, and and again, you know, going back to Brian, your earlier point, like we bring our whole selves to work, right? And then and that's that's where you see the most productivity, the most engaged employees. And part of that is we're not just start, you know, sitting here with our titles and whatever, you know, we we have all these important parts of our lives. And, and so, you know, so that that's a little aside about creating a space for ERGs. But, um, but, but as it as it relates to, you know, sort of being surrounded. Yeah, I, I mean, I came out of college and was really passionate about LGBTQ rights. And, and I wanted to get get involved and you know I sort of I went to law school with that um with that mindset uh I remember I wrote my law school entrance uh essay about or my my law school admissions essay about like basically wanting to change the world for queer people um and so that was that was my path and that's that's what I did and I think the the beauty of that is you're surrounded by people who are in this shared idea of like this is what we all want to do we want to be be make things better for LGBTQ people and this is how we're going to do it. And you have all these different tactics, whatever, but, but, but importantly, it's just a really safe space. It's a safe space to bring your, yourself, that piece of yourself to work. Um, I, you know, the LGBTQ community is, is not even close to immune from other issues of representation, um, even in the community, like in those letters, right? Like bi people and trans people are very invisible. They get very little funding toward the work that they're doing. Um, that for so long, our movement was really focused on marriage equality, which is really important, but that's one part of, right, of our work. Um, HIV positive programs, like how, all of these different pieces um, are part of, part of the work that we do. And, and all that to say that 
it's, I think it's critical to be able to be around people and feel supported and to keep pushing, right? Keep looking like where are there still issues that we need to be addressing here? And there, there are plenty of them in, 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 in any movement, in any, any space that we operate within. So again, like using like okay, we're sitting here, we have this privilege of X, Y, and Z. How are we looking out for people who don't have that privilege, who don't have that platform, who aren't able to, you know, sit at the table as a trans person of color and say, here's the real deal, people. Like, forget about marriage equality, right? I'm trying to just get a job and I can't even walk in and get, you know, have somebody notice me beyond being a you know, a black trans person. So, so I think we, we have to keep, keep pushing ourselves and, but the space is important and, and trying to create safety and, and community is critical to that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and Hillary, I, I appreciate you elevating some of the, uh, the realities that face the, just with even in the, the LGBTQ plus community of um, that marginalization of, of, of different identities. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's a story that I sometimes tell that I will share very quickly, which is, um, there was a time where I think if you would have asked me, do I have an understanding of what members of this community, the LGBTQ plus community face, I would have said confidently, yes, as a member of that community without fully appreciating the various intersectional identities that actually create marginalization. And of course, I have a very different understanding today, um, you know, very much aligned with what you just shared. And, and one of those facts uh, is, which is tragic is that Black trans women have a life expectancy of 33 years. Um, and, you know, that is, you know, that's not something that I think that would shock any of us. And that's in a, in a, a you know, a developed country like the United States. It's so tragic. Um, and so we have to do more, even just within our communities, to, to create safety and inclusion. <clears throat> The other thing I so I'm going to transition to like let's talk about the work of the work. Um, I, what I love and Michelle and Hillary, everyone's heard. They're like, we should talk about the work and how we do the work and how it hits it hits workplaces. And Hillary, you're right, ERGs are so important. Um, and there's an intentional reason why I start with the humanity part of this conversation because it's so easy for us to go to the work conversation. That's how we're all programmed. And it's important. That's why we're here, because we want to create better workplaces. But workplaces start with the fact that we are humans at those workplaces. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about the work of the work. And, you know, Michelle, I want to just hear from you about the, you know, how, how does the Televerde organization, how do you, how do you, you've mentioned a few things, but how do you change the lives of these women? And what are some of the things that, that they face when they try to re-enter the, the working world? Yeah. <clears throat> well, so as I mentioned, Televerde is a company that was founded based on providing women in prison jobs. So as a company, we have now, um, we have, we call them engagement centers. They started as call centers um, located in uh, seven women's prisons across the country, Arizona, Indiana, and Florida, currently employing probably about 450 um, incarcerated women. Um, and so while they're here, they are learning um, professional skills. They're doing um, inbound and outbound customer service. They're doing uh, sales development, lead generation and sales development um, and uh, technical administration for some of the biggest technology companies in the world. So companies like SAP, Adobe, uh, GE, Broadcom, I mean, these big technology companies outsource um, their sales and marketing and, and customer service um, activities to us to do. And we run the business based on the idea that whatever we do as a company, we should be able, we should figure out how we can train the women on the inside to be able to do that work so that they can, they can have a variety of career paths. So not everybody wants to get out of prison and go work in a call center. So how do we provide a wide variety of career paths for them? And so, so that's the first thing was, is teach them the job skills. And then uh, the Tilbury Foundation, when we when we first started the foundation, it was it was probably like I would say out of a sense of moral obligation because we knew as a company that um, we could not employ every single woman coming out of incarceration at our company because sooner or later we would have everybody on the inside working for us on the outside and there'd be no no jobs left on the inside and so um, how did we make sure that we were providing the women with pathways? 
um, to employment. And so, um, and we had women coming out going into six figure jobs. And so we really understood that if we weren't doing everything we, we could to make sure that they were fully prepared personally and professionally to walk into any organization and sit down at the table and be comfortable and confident and feel like they belonged there and that they, they deserved that seat at the table, then we were doing them a disservice. And so the foundation does, as I mentioned before, we've got this six month comprehensive program where we uh, focus on the personal professional development uh, pro things that you need. So there's more, there's more to transition than just the job. Um, there's housing, there's children, there's family reunification, there's substance abuse, there's emotional intelligence, there's trauma, there's just this whole pile of stuff to get you ready to walk out the door. And then there's walking out the door. And then, you know, it's all the things you need when you get out the door. And that's interview skills, uh, employment opportunities, housing, cars, um, everything, healthcare, all of those things. And so uh, the foundation comes along and provides that for the women of Televerde. And then as kind of the, the next thing, as I said before, like when I realized we had the secret sauce, um, we launched what we call our Career Paths Program, um, which we launched it here, actually in the spot where I'm sitting right now, um, a little over two years ago, um, where we, rather than a job, we just provide training, certification, education um, for the women to get become customer service inside sales, computer tech professionals, um, so they can learn those skills. We pair it with that comprehensive reentry program so that women who do not have the opportunity to work for Televerde um, can have a similar experience. Because as I said, there's only 400 women who work for Televerde and there are currently a quarter of a million women in prison in our country, 80,000 of them get out every year. Um, I personally believe they all deserve the opportunity to find and fulfill their full potential. And so um, for the foundation, we have, I just got back from Indiana where we launched um, our fifth workforce Force Development Center. So we now, um, our programs will graduate about 300 women a year with the training and the certification. Um, and we're on a mission to open up uh, 10 more centers within the next five years. Awesome. I just, I want to applause. Um, we'll do the, we'll do this applause for now. Um, I love that. And th again, thank you for the important work you do. Um, you know, I, I want to ask something specific as we're we're look, thinking about um, <clears throat> how this in, reentering the workplace. How, how how have background checks played out in the in your space? And what are the conversations you have with employers about background checks? Yeah, background checks are uh, are getting better. Um, I, I will just I'll tell a brief story about my own personal experience. Is there was a there was a time. Oh, probably about seven, eight years ago that I was considering leaving Televerde. I was, I was being uh, actively recruited by an executive search firm and um, had worked my way down the path to kind of the next thing. And they're like, okay, we need you to go online and fill out the, you know, fill out the thing. Um, and I got to the question that said, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And, and I thought to myself, well, God, it's been, you know, 10, 15 years. Do I, do I, do I, can I say no? And as I reread the question, it says, have you ever, have you ever? And I said, okay, well, the honest answer is yes. And it promptly just said, thank you for your interest in this position. And like, even like telling you that story today, I just got like, you know, goosebumps down my back because it, it just was such a harsh reality that when, when does the scarlet letter ever go away, right? Like I, I'm not a felon, a felon is something I did. You know, and, and so um, things have gotten better because a lot of states have come forward. And, and let's be honest, it's it's um, because of the, the demand for talent and, and companies have to start to find um, different sources, unique talent pools. People, company, people have had to start to say, OK, well, where are we overlooking people? Because if if uh, one third of our country has a criminal record, if you're still basing your hiring decisions based on whether or not somebody's ever been convicted of a fe felony, you're overlooking one third of the entire population of our country. So 
that's kind of where things have moved. There's great um, organizations. Uh, you know, Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan Chase has started the the Business Coalition, the Responsible Business Coalition, um, challenging organizations to change the way that they're doing things. Um, and and so it's getting. And states have passed laws that say you you can no longer ask. Um, but it's still. It, it's there's still whole entire industries that d discriminate because they can. Um, it's honestly having having a criminal record um, is the one thing in our country that, that it's still legally and morally acceptable to discriminate against. Hmm. So that's what we have to that's what we have to fix. And that's why these conversations are so important, because when we have the conversations, people start to scratch their head and say, well, wh why is that? Like, why do we do that? Well, and as I'm as I'm hearing you um, talk, I mean, one thing that comes to mind for me is, um, and it's a whole conversation we could probably spend an hour on itself, is the concept of cancel culture um, and the problems with cancel culture of, you know, when I, like, if you've been convicted of a felony, you're now canceled forever. Um, and, you know, we live very long lives, hopefully, if we're, if we're fortunate enough to do that. Um, and, you know, I, I you know, at your, your, me and Michelle's story, Michelle, your story alone is a great example of you can, you can head down the wrong path um, and you can find your way back to a better path. Um, and I think that's true for any of us as humans. We can learn from our mistakes. We can do our best to, to make it right and to do better. And, um, and I'm a big believer that we should give people a chance. Um, and uh, um, so I think that's part of this conversation as well. Yeah, when I think that's exactly right, because the, the challenge comes is if we don't give people a chance, if people get out of prison and they can't get a job and they can't get a place to live because of their background, then there's no way that they can be successful. Like it's, you know, it's just a, a circular thing. So. Well, and, and then they, then, you know, this goes, I think is one of the contributing factors to the recidivism rate. I said it um, is, you know, if you, if you can't find a way to make a living and to pay your bills and to be a contributing member of society, then you have to find a way to live and survive. Right. Um, right. It, know, it's just like, it, it, it goes like this. Well, you know what, if I can't get a job, I know how to hustle. <laughs> I yeah. get my hustle on, you know. Yeah. So we, we, we don't we don't give them you know give the, those humans very many opportunities. So yeah, or many choices, I guess I should say. You know, and the other thing that I want to mention, and then Hillary, I'm going to ask you about your work. Um, something you said, Michelle, which I think is it reminded me of you know the programs you offer, um, the life skills, the mental health services, the you know those various you know, aspects of how do we not only find a job, but how do we become. Um, responsible, productive citizens in society. That one of the things I've learned recently over the last couple of years is about the importance of scholarship programs. Also, having similar types of programs, just giving money um, is not enough. Um, there's also those individuals. Many of those individuals who need that money to go to college also need a, a access to a variety of other life skills and services. Um, and uh, one of our clients is partnering with the university to develop a scholarship program that's holistic in their approach to really providing the, the support throughout their entire um, uh, bachelor's degree program so that they can make it through successfully and be ready to, to, to do something on the other side. So um, that, I think that resonates. And I wanted to mention here for those of, those of you listening, like that's another lens on this. Hillary, tell us about your work. So, um, as I mentioned, I work for a company called Athletes Unlimited. It's a network of professional women's sports uh, leagues. And we, the, the, the part of the work that really drew me, besides that it's really fun to watch these really incredible elite athletes um, compete, is the company is basically using sports and the power of sports to create what we see as the way that business should be done in this country. And so, so for example, I mean, just the fact that, that we exist and that, you know, female athletes get just a fraction of coverage and um, airtime. And when people think of professional athletes, they usually don't think about women like that, that in and of itself is, is sort of challenging a cultural conception. But beyond that, we've, we've been really intentional about building the company from the ground up um, using systems that are equitable, that think about not just the people who 
are the shareholders, but the actual stakeholders. So, so for example, um, we all of all of the decisions in the the company related to the leagues and the athletes that are playing are made in conjunction with the athletes themselves. And the athletes themselves, they're not there are no team owners in our leagues. Um, the athletes themselves are representing their leagues, and they're the ones calling the shots. And from anything from uniforms all the way through to uh, to profit sharing, right? These are the, the, the people, the, the concept is that we're redistributing the power to the people that are, that the company is being built upon. Um, and I think that that's a really important concept when we think about like, what can corporations do? Well, start by thinking like, who's, who's benefiting from this company right now, right? Who's, who, who's, who's in line to sort of make the most money or have the most decision-making power. And if it's not the, if it's not the employees or if it's not the people you're representing, then right out of the gate, you got to rethink how, how to, how to shuffle things around. Right. Um, and so, you know, another important tenant of the work that we do is, is how do we have the right policies that support both our athletes and our staff? And so, you know, we think about like, how do people be parents and, and, and do their work, right? So it, for our athletes, it's how do they continue to be professional athletes and be parents for our company? It's how do you go on site and be in a venue and, and, and be a parent at the same time. So thinking about what policies do you have to support parents around caregiving and, um, and, and pregnancy and the like. So, so those sort of like things that, that seem pretty obvious, right. Are things that you can build into the company that would create that just creates a better place to work um, and, and a better, you know, the be a better ability for people to be able to, to do what they want to do. Um, and the last thing I'll say about about um, some of the work we're doing is we are really conscious of making sure that people's stories are told. And so the, another compelling reason is part of this conversation is how do you give people platforms to tell their story, one, and have other people listen and sort of learn from the diversity of experience that we build empathy from. So, you know, this this conversation is such a prime example, right? How how all the things that Michelle is talking about, it's so, it's it's like, wow, this is incredible. This is like blowing my mind how far back we are just as a society setting people up if they have to go through a background check that automatically disqualifies them when they're just trying to get employment, right? So, so hearing Michelle's story and having that be out in the world is really critical to building empathy, right? And thinking about how do we change what, the way that we do our business so that we can make sure that we are, we are doing it in the most equitable and responsible way that we can as a corporation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, thank you for sharing about so many of the different parts of, of what Athletes Unlimited is doing. And you know, something I just want to double double down, double click on uh, is the, um, uh, we're not gambling, so we'll double click, that feels like a virtual environment, um, is um, <clears throat> the importance of the benefits programs that are offered um, to really consider the needs of everyone in your um, your workforce. Um, you know, historically, as an HR person, I've been involved in those decisions, and um, there's so many of the decisions that even I was involved in for so many years were what benefits the greatest representation of the whole representation of the whole um, needs of, of those that are underrepresented in those conversations. Um, and so that's something that, that I, I really try to get involved in when we're working on clients is let's make sure we talk about the benefits of your time-off program, those support services, and how they meet the needs of marginalized and underrepresented groups. And those are conversations that don't happen enough, so I love that you're doing that. Hillary, I want to ask if you were going to make – Give you know, for business leaders, decision makers, CEOs uh, who are listening. If you're going to give them one or two challenges of like do this in your company, you know your organization. What would what would what would be the, the challenge or two that come up come to mind for you? I would say talk to your employees and just ask them how things are going. Like maybe it's about benefits, maybe it's about how the company staff meeting goes, maybe it's about. Do we have our cameras on or off when we're doing certain things? Like talk to the employees. And again, this is where this representation matters. Like the employees are bringing themselves to your company at your service. 
ask them how it's going. That's what I would say. Find ways to, to get that feedback loop. And so I, I love that you just brought that up around the benefits, Brian. Like, are we reaching the people that need the benefits with what they need the most? Um, that I would, I would implore folks to have take that tact. Yeah, thank you, Hillary. And and I, I would I'll, the the thing I'll just add to that last that bullet that you just shared is um, that oftentimes it's also very inexpensive because you might only be offering something that's going to benefit a couple people, but it becomes very affordable then. But it's so significant for them as an individual, and it's nominal from a bottom, from a you know, P and L perspective. Uh, so I love that. And uh, and I also love and starting with the voices of your employees. Like, what do your employees need? Because you're right, Hillary, it's not a one size fit all. We, we can't sort of, the three of us couldn't sit here and say, here's the right answer for every company or organization, because it's about the people that work at that organization. So I love that. Michelle, what, what challenge would you offer to CEOs and decision makers that are with us and listening and learning? Well, uh, the... Former CEO and and my mentor and coach, uh, I think probably summed it up best. He, in, in, he said, you know, ask yourself, would you like to be judged for the rest of your life based on the worst decisions you made on the worst days of your life? And if the answer to that is no, then I suggest then I suggest you go and inspect what you expect from your hiring policies, from your hiring managers. Um, what exactly is happening in the process? Uh, are you, you know, are your processes fair and equitable? And are you excluding people for, you know, unnecessarily? Um, and and then think about how how you make changes in your organization to to support others. I love that. So important, so important. And uh, I want to make sure I'm, I give a shout out to Kendra Maples, who's with us today. If, if you're, for those of you who are with us, if you haven't um, tuned into the Culture Crush podcast, you got to check it out. Um, and I know Kendra's a big fan of Michelle's. Um, she's said a few kind things about you, Michelle, and just mentioned how she learns from you every time she gets to hear you speak, which of course I would echo. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I should also just mention, I got to be on the Culture Crush podcast. So of course, Kendra and I, Kendra's a good friend now. So, I'm, I'm a huge Kendra fan. Hi, Kendra. We love Kendra. So, Hillary, we'll get you on the Culture Crush podcast. We got to make sure it's every, we got to have 100%. Um, well, I know, I can't believe we're almost out of time. Um, so, I want to just ask um, each of you just to share um, how do people find you, follow you, connect with you? And then, um, as we wrap up, you know, again, just sort of anchoring in the, 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 the fact that we are humans. What's bringing you joy today? So Hillary, I will ask you to go first. Yeah, I, I hope that people connect with me on LinkedIn. This is a great, um, a great platform. And actually this, um, this, uh, you know, we're, I'm, I'm now bridged with, with Brian and Michelle on LinkedIn. So please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, something that's bringing me joy. Well, this conversation has brought me a lot of joy, not to be kind of cliche about it, but, uh, but I really appreciate it. And, and I've learned so much, um, uh, from Michelle and, and, and being here. Um, and, uh, you know, my kid's home with a sickness right now. And so bringing is what's bringing me joy is that he's on the healing side of <laughs> what's keeping him home from school. So let's get that kiddo off to school. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. What about you, Michelle? How do people find you and connect with you and, and what's bringing you joy today? Um, easiest way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. If you just find me, I'm the only Michelle Sirocco out there, so it's pretty easy to do. Um, and uh, I will send me a message. I will I respond to everybody. You can also go to our website, calibertyfoundation.org. Um, and as the CEO of a nonprofit organization, no self-respecting CEO would, would finish a conversation like this without saying, um, we are always looking for volunteers for donations. Um, the work that we do, uh, requires a lot of support and support from business leaders is really where we get it. Uh, particularly always looking for people who are willing to hire. Um, and we have a whole program for job placement. And so I'd love to talk to anybody about um, how you can fix your job process and how you could hire some of our women. Um, yeah. I love that. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Oh, well, did you share what brings you joy? 
Oh, what brings me joy? You know what? What brings me joy more than anything is honestly the work, the work that I do is I'm going to walk out of this room right now. I'm going to go through those doors and there are 50 women out there all dressed in orange who are dying to ask me a question, show me something, tell me something. And I will walk out of here today and my cup will be overflowing because I feel like I've had an impact on somebody's life today. I love that. I'm going to do the, the, the virtual clap again. Um, excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Michelle. Um, of course, for me, LinkedIn as well is also great. You can find me on Facebook and on Instagram as well, and Hummingbird Humanity on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn also. Um, what's bringing me joy today? You know, I just I want to just honor the wonderful humans um, that help Hummingbird Humanity what it is today. I have this beautiful new sign, which I must give credit to. This is our first time showing the sign live. So uh, Lindsay um, was behind that, um, who's also one of the people, our marketing communications manager, who's behind this event and helping bring it to life along with Jade and um, and also the Nick and Andrea who um, did all the, the work uh, behind the scenes to bring the Hummingbird Humanity Foundation to life um, and just all the, the wonderful team um, who help me learn every day and help me be better at this work that I get to do. And of course, that includes the two of you who I've learned so much from in this conversation. So thank you again for, for being with me today. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you again for all of you who are with us today. Um, it's 301, so I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, and um, hope you'll invite us. You'll, you'll um, return next month. We'll make sure to send invites as well. Um, but I hope you'll return next month where we have another conversation on human centered leading. Michelle, Hillary, thank you for being with us. Um, for everyone out there watching or listening, um, hopefully um, we'll speak again soon. So until then, stay safe and be well. <laughs>